everyone. Welcome back to The Jacobin Show. I'm Jen Pan, here today with Paul Prescott. Paul, what's new and what do we have going on today? Well, we have a great show. Uh, we have uh, Les Leopold on to talk about his um, great uh, political education program he runs in unions called Runaway Inequality. Um, right there, there it is there. He also wrote an amazing book about Tony Mazaki, the legendary labor leader. So we're going to talk about all of that with Les we also, I want to mention before Les comes on, we have another special guest who I think you all know. Yes, it's Cale Brooks, our producer. He's here for every show, uh, but he will be coming in front of the screen for today's show uh, because he wrote an article recently called From Posting to Politics, uh, which is, of course, where we got the title for today's episode. Um, and, you know, he, the article's really great. Uh, it's in Jacobin, of course. I suggest, you know, go 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 check it out if you haven't already. Um, but the kind of overarching theme of today's show is political education, uh, you know, organizing workers um, and political messaging. Um, so on that note, uh, uh, I want to I want to start off by talking about political messaging um, because there was a pretty interesting study that came out recently by two political scientists at Yale, um, and what they were doing in this study is they wanted to look at how framing things as racial justice measures affected people's support for race neutral policies. Uh, and before I dive into the study, I just want to say, you know, right off the bat, of course, messaging is a very small component of organizing. Um, I want to be really clear that there's, of course, no magic phrase that you can just utter that'll make people vote a certain way or behave a certain way, let alone become socialists, right? But that said, I do think it's important to think about how we frame what it is that we're trying to argue and what it is that we do. So when it comes to the racial justice frame, um, these researchers at Yale noticed that over the last couple of years and over the last year in particular, where we've seen a lot of heightened attention to racial inequality and racial disparities, uh, the researchers noticed that Democrats were increasingly leaning toward framing their policies as racial justice measures. So you, you know, we have tons of examples of different politicians at the state and federal level saying that X, Y, and Z policies are reparations, for example. Um, a very classic one is uh, politicians like uh, Elizabeth Warren and Ayanna Presley have talked about student, uh, student debt relief being a racial justice issue. Uh, so let's run a clip of Ayanna talking about that. Let me be clear. The student debt crisis has always been a racial and economic justice issue. But for too long, the narrative has excluded Black and Latinx communities and the ways in which this debt has exacerbated deeply entrenched racial and economic inequities in our nation. These disparities didn't just magically occur. They are the consequences of generations of systemic racism, discrimination, and what I call policy violence that has systemically denied Black and Latinx families the opportunity to build wealth forcing our families to take on greater rates of student debt for the chance at the same degree as our white counterparts. So this is interesting. Again, I feel like this is kind of a standard way that Democrats talk about a lot of policies these days. Um, so what these Yale researchers set out to do was they surveyed around 5,000 people. Um, I think each of the respondents took an online survey uh, where they were exposed to different forms of messaging. And what the researchers wanted to determine is whether people's support for certain certain policies increases when it's framed as this racial justice measure. Um, so I'm going to get to their findings in a second. But first, I want to look at some of the messages that they presented to their respondents. So the first frame they showed to respondents was a neutral frame. Uh, and that reads something like this. So this is about uh, increasing the minimum wage. So this is a very standard kind of minimum wage message. Congress has not increased the federal minimum wage currently set at 725 since 2009. Some Democrats are proposing a policy that would gradually raise the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour by 2025. After 2025, the minimum wage would be adjusted each year to keep pace with growth in the median wage, a measure of wages for typical workers. So, you know, pretty dry, just a standard, like this is neutral, this is what a minimum wage increase would do. Then the researchers looked at how people responded to a race frame, which goes like this. So the people who were exposed to the race frame got kind of the standard messaging, you know, the neutral frame about the uh, minimum wage, but then they also got this. 
Democrats say that a minimum wage increase would boost incomes for people of color, especially women of color, who make up a disproportionate share of low-wage workers. This is why Democrats say that raising the minimum wage would be an effective tool for racial justice. So the researchers didn't just look at the racial justice frame. They also wanted to see how the racial justice frame compared to a class frame and then a class plus race frame. So this is where it gets really interesting. So I'm now going to read the class frame, which goes like this. Democrats say that low wages hurt all workers, especially those with lower income levels, and that a minimum wage would lift nearly a million people out of poverty. This is why Democrats say that raising the minimum wage would be an effective tool for economic justice. And then finally, the class plus race frame um, basically combines the race frame that I read before with the class frame, and it looks like this. Uh, Democrats say that a minimum wage increase would boost incomes for people of color. Uh, you can run through that, uh, you know, it, Again, like I said, it's just kind of mashing the race frame and the class frame together. A minimum wage increase would lift nearly a million people, black, brown, and white, out of poverty. This is why Democrats say that raising the minimum wage would be an effective tool for racial and economic justice. So again, they kind of present their respondents with four different frames. Um, and what they found, uh, to now jump to the findings, if we can pull up that chart, is that among all of those, if you can look at the top line, the class frame actually did quite a bit better than either the race frame or surprisingly did better than even the class plus race frame. Now, I wanna add a caveat here. Um, the authors are really clear in their study that the, the results are statistically significant, but not overwhelming, right? So these are just moderate effects. So it's not like the class frame like so vastly performed the other two frames. It was just like, we noticed that this is doing a little better. Um, and so, so I think that this is really interesting because uh, again, you know, we heard a lot of discussion uh, during the last, uh, you know, two presidential cycles about how we should be framing these issues. Um, most famously, Bernie Sanders was often hit with the charge that, you know, he wasn't talking about race enough, um, although he does use the racial justice frame quite a lot. Um, and the authors of the study point that out. But the point being that, you know, this accusation was often leveled against him, that he didn't talk about race enough, that he was being a class reductionist, uh, that he, you know, he, he didn't get the language right. Um, and so, again, I think that these results are really interesting because if we're just going from the study, it shows that there's some evidence, actually, that using a class frame isn't as bad as you might think. Um, so I, I have a few more comments, but I want to turn it over to Paul now um, just, just to see if you have any thoughts about, not necessarily about this study, but because you are not just a propagandist on YouTube, but also an organizer, um, what do you make of these findings? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're interesting. And I, I think they kind of confirmed a lot of what I've just kind of seen just through anecdotal experience. And I think, you know, Eric Levitz had a piece out about this that kind of touched on this point. And I think it's kind of ironic because for so long, the strategy of the right wing has been to insist that policies that in fact benefit the majority of working people are actually just special programs for minorities. And that's how they demonize them. And I think in a way, I don't think intentionally, but in a way when the framing is so heavily, this is a program, even if you say disproportionately benefits black, brown and, and whatever, um, you're kind of playing into that same framing instead mm -hmm. of insisting that, no, this I'm not going to play into the race bait game that the right wing wants us to do. And, you know, because we know that in fact, like welfare programs actually are used by far more white people than black people in total, mm -hmm. you know? So I think it's just kind of a, it, it it's kind of undermining our, our attempt to defeat the right wing and kind of playing into that in, in some respects. Mm -hmm. And I also wonder a lot with this kind of messaging, like who really is the audience? Right. It's like, are you, are you trying to convince white people that these policies are good for people of color? And, and if so, that doesn't seem like a good way to convince them to support the policy, you know, or are you trying to convince people of color? And I don't think people of color need to be told that these mm -hmm. things are good for them or mm -hmm. disproportionately benefit them. So in that sense, it's like, what is the audience? Right. And I'll, and I'll tell you like a little anecdote about this. I think those of you, people that know me or have seen some of what I've written know that I love talking about the post office and I love talking <laughs> it's true, about, <laughs> you do. <laughs> I love talking about how the post office especially is good for black workers. Now, last summer when there was all the attacks on the post office in Philly, a bunch of activists and organizations, we were flyering post office around the city of Philadelphia. And the post office, you know, that was closest to me is in a majority black neighborhood, probably 
98% of the customers are black. It's not like I needed to tell those people that the post office is important for black communities. You know, A, a lot of them know it. And even in talking to them, talked about, oh, my cousin, my brother, my sister works at the post office. But also it's kind of not the real issue at hand. I mean, mm -hmm. the issue was to save the post office. Like, I really feel like if I would have said that, the response either would have been like, yeah, we know, or like, why are you saying this right now? Exactly. <laughs> right. Like, you know, not, I don't think they would be like hostile to it. But mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just important to note that it's like, you know, I think like you've said before, like it is objectively true actually that these things would benefit racial justice. But like, I don't know where that framing gets us necessarily, whether it's with mm -hmm. white voters or uh, voters of color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think that's a really good question. Like who who is this actually intended for? Because the underlying assumption uh, is that people of color uh, black black voters in particular will respond to racial justice messages, right? Like this was the whole criticism against Bernie supposedly being bad on race. If you want to win over black voters, like you're going to have to amplify your racial justice message. Uh, I don't know how many times I heard that. Um, and like you said, I don't think it's actually clear that that's what voters of color uh, overwhelmingly prioritize or overwhelmingly respond to. I mean, I know that, you know, that seems like an intuitive assumption, but a lot of the polling, you know, uh, actually shows, as we've mentioned on the show many times, that the things that uh, voters of color and especially working class voters are concerned about are things like jobs, healthcare, the economy. I mean, what we call bread and butter issues. And they're not actually so concerned with uh, racial justice language or, you know, seeing, quote, people that look like them uh, in, you know, cabinet positions. Um, or at least those don't rank as high as, you know, kind of the stuff of everyday life. And just to go back to the Yale study, uh, they actually did break down, uh, you know, people's responses by uh, race and by political orientation. And they found that for black Democrats, black Democrats basically responded to the race frame and the class frame exactly the same. So there was no like advantage for, you know, framing things as a racial justice issue for black voters. Using the class frame got the job done as well. Um, and then, also, I think unsurprisingly, uh, with white voters, there was a there was a huge preference for the class frame over the race frame. Now, you know, there are we can talk about why that is. I mean, obviously, there are still many, you know, many racial resentments. There's still a lot of racism. Um, I think that it's fair to say that a lot of white voters, um, you know, have 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 those resentments and don't and again, much like the dog whistling around welfare in the 80s, like don't want to or don't feel, you know, supportive of programs that they think are intended for racial minorities. Um, so, you know, that's, I think that that, you know, it, it is definitely, is definitely something that, um, you know, is, I don't know, I guess is like, you can say what you want about white voters, I guess, but at the end of the day, it's sort of like, well, we're trying to create a message in order to win this policy, right? Right. And again, we don't want to confirm the stupid and inaccurate stereotypes mm -hmm. about certain programs only being for minorities. Mm -hmm. And and I think something else, and like you said, like there's no magic message that is just going to yeah. like do this for us. But I think another point is just clarity overall. And I, I kind of think about this as a high school teacher, because it's like, if I want an assignment done the way I want it to be done, I better be as clear <laughs> about the directions and simplified in a way, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think politically too, it's like the more, I don't know, the more dashes and slashes and parentheses and caveats you're adding to a, mm -hmm. an electoral message, you know, I just think whether that's about race or anything really, you know, you, you want clarity. And I right. think that's just key. And sometimes things get very muddled when after every sentence, you have to say disproportionately this, that, and the other, you know, I, I just think like clarity is very key, you know, mm -hmm. in general. Yeah. Um, well, on the note of clarity, I think, I think it's time our, we brought on our friend, young kale, uh, the author, our number of recent... one <laughs> clearest poster ever. Jeez. Exactly. Our, our number not one a poster poster boy. No, you you're, are, you're not, you're not catching our number me one boy poster. <laughs> Actually, yeah. if everybody on screen now, Paul, you're the only one who posts. Paul's the right. only one actually on Twitter. <laughs> I mean, Follow Facebook. Him. Kale right, has yeah. a Facebook, right? <laughs> Jen is the only pure one here. She's uh... <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, look, maybe you I have mean, an Instagram that's like crazy where you take a picture every 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah, I definitely do. No, I'm yeah. just kidding. Um, Jen, Jen's posting fits on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I wanted to, just before we go to social media, one thing I wanted to mention about the uh, uh, framing on, on race and classes, it reminded me of something actually that uh, Vivek Chibber had said on our very first show back in December, um, I forget what the question exactly was, but he said something along the lines of socialists absolutely have to be race sensitive, mm -hmm. that we have to be aware, like in our actual actions and our policies and our messaging that obviously, like we have to deal with the specifics of our political situation. And in the US, obviously, race plays a big role in a lot of that. Yeah. But socialists should never be racist. Uh, they should not have policies that are race specific or mm -hmm. race exclusive, mm -hmm. that socialists should not be spending their time trying to decide what oppressions are worse than others, that we oppose all oppressions and, uh, and we do it everywhere and where we can. Um, but ultimately this comes down to a question of strategy of like, how do we actually deal with these things? How do we actually address uh, racism as it really exists, um, whether it be institutionally or legally or politically, or more often now, you know, post civil rights era, it's more often than not going to be uh, something in economics that mm -hmm. it's because of prior historical um, inequalities, you end up seeing that uh, lead into inequalities today. Um, just because right. that's the way the market uh, will you know, mm -hmm. reward some and punish others. Mm -hmm. And so if you come to the market with little resources or little information, you're not going to perform as well. And so as a population, that's been the biggest challenge in the post-civil rights era uh, for black and brown people. Um, but again, that just means we have to be race sensitive that our actual policies have to be universal because mm -hmm. we have to think about how do we build the coalitions? Right. How do we, how do we actually get this passed? And ultimately, how do we create a society where everyone is treated equal as like we have full human rights in, in right. the most kind of actual real sense of the term and not kind of the phony right. capital H, capital R human rights. But uh, every single human being has value and, uh, and having true equality. And ultimately, like, I don't see how else you're going to get rid of like bigoted apologies and your attacking the material and economic roots that mm -hmm. that give life to those ideologies in the first place so yeah my... I, I i mean i i agree with uh you and by extension vivek of course um i i also think what's interesting about this yale study is the policies that they were kind of putting forward or the policies that they were testing with the respondents were actually universal policies so they were talking about you know expanding housing they were talking about medicare for all they were talking about a 15 dollars minimum wage and what they were trying to look at is what is what happens when you frame these actually universal policies as something that is uh, race, you know, racial justice oriented. Um, you know, as we were saying earlier, it's it's actually true. Like everything that Ayanna Presley said about you know student student debt as a racial justice measure is true. Like. Black and brown students have higher levels of debt. Black and brown students are disproportionately affected by the student debt crisis. That's all true. I guess the question is whether that is effective messaging, whether we can build a coalition around a universal problem uh, by focusing on the particulars. So um, I guess, you know, on that note though, I wanna read a quote from your article, uh, your great article in Jacobin. Uh, let's see, so you write, Online organizing, both because of its removal from sites of power and because of its deeply antisocial configuration, is not capable of building the kind of solidarity or coordination our politics demand. Uh, and I, I like wanted to zero in on that quote because, after all, we are talking about messaging here. Um, everything that we we do, by which I mean the three of us on screen. Um, sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's bring them on. The doorbell. Whoever yeah, it is. You know, should right. I just like invite them onto the show? Um, <laughs> everything, everything that we do, you know, he, the three of us here on screen right now is internet based. I mean, we're literally right. on a YouTube show, but we all we are? also have. <laughs> yeah, Paul. We're just chilling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is uh, news to Paul. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I just I I wonder, you know, 
given that we all live our lives online, like what do you see as the limitations of, of social media and like even just the internet in general for socialist organizing? Right, well, I think it's, um, so it's limitations uh, and not like an absolute, uh, it's not absolute. So of course we need to use the internet um, if, because of just, whether it be because of COVID or, or even when we're not in COVID, of course, like we're gonna need to reach people by the millions um, and we're not quite there yet on Jacobin. So hit like and subscribe. <laughs> um, but I mean, we, we do need this as a medium to actually reach uh, our audience and uh, because we don't presently have the power to go door to door. But ultimately, I think in order to be effective in our in our political ambitions and socialists are pretty ambitious right now though we want a massive expansion of public expenditure going to like provide for people's human and and social and economic and, and political needs uh that is going to be taking that what we're doing is going to be taking on the most powerful ruling class in human history yeah so and like we just saw in bessemer alabama uh with the amazon union drive uh amazon was able to crush that with very little effort mm -hmm. in a grander scale of like how much they could have put towards that fight. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the thing is that of course, like the people who voted no, because the, obviously if you're not familiar, the outcome was that by like a two to one margin, um, the workers there voted not to unionize. Um, the people who voted no didn't say in their vote or by voting, they didn't say, I don't deserve uh, healthcare. I don't deserve a uh, living wage. I I should just sell my soul to the corporation and have, you know, just be further and further destroyed mentally and physically and socially by this company in my life. And obviously that's not what they're saying. They're saying, I mean, this is kind of the only game in town here. This is the only mm -hmm. person that's going to be giving me $15, uh, a $15 wage in, in Bessemer. And, you know, I don't really want to, uh, it's, I'm not going to be able to effectively challenge this corporation. Mm -hmm. um, so just, and, and so the big kind of thing, the reason I'm bringing this up, of course, is just that there was a massive social media effort around this. There was a massive yeah. traditional media effort around this. Um, Sanders was doing a ton of media for this, a lot of his surrogates as well. Um, there was a lot of momentum if you only looked at this from online, um, but the challenge is, is that just having all of that social media and that media momentum is not going to translate into workers on the ground thinking, mm -hmm. yeah, we actually can fight the boss and win. And we're going to be able to like fight off reoccurring attacks that we can actually sustain this over the long haul. Mm -hmm. That takes real relationships that takes trust, that takes solidarity among workers. And I'm just not convinced yet that mm -hmm. social media has the capacity to ever get to that level. Uh, so it's it's just mostly like, even if this isn't like a perfect theoretical argument, I really just think practically and strategically, we have to understand that social media is not cutting it for what we need in mm -hmm. order to like build up our side, our forces against corporations, against the ruling class right now. I want to quickly underscore what you just said by showing some figures of who uses Twitter and how they use Twitter. Uh, so the first one is from Pew Research. And uh, this graph, uh, I don't know if you can see, Twitter is a kind of like goldenrod color and it's sort of near the bottom. And basically 22, it says that 22% of adults in the US use Twitter. Compare that to YouTube, which is up there in red at 73%, and then Facebook uh, in blue, right below that at 69%. Uh, and it, you know, I think that it's really interesting because we we hear a lot about Twitter. We show tweets on you know this, this channel all the time. We talk about things that happen on Twitter. Um, I have already confessed to not being on Twitter, but like I know what's going on on Twitter because people send me tweets or because you know news outlets will quote Twitter. I mean, watch any cable news program uh, and they'll be running tweets from like whoever across the screen at any given time. So clearly, like Twitter is interesting because it clearly has this outsized role on the discourse, but also like in many ways, nobody's on it. Um, right. I also want to share like, a, 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 a this is also from Pew Research Center, and this is how many people uh, or, or where the tweets are coming from. So 80% of the tweets on Twitter are coming from 
10% of tweeters. <laughs> so again, this is like a very small handful of people who are, you know, as I say, like putting their thumb on the discourse. Uh, and for that reason alone, I think that it's worth paying attention to Twitter. I mean, you know, when you think about who uses Twitter, it's journalists, it's uh, people in the political class, uh, celebrities, of course. Um, and, and, you know, because of this kind of outsized role that it plays in the media and in shaping certain narratives, in, in shaping politics, um, it's worth paying attention to. That said, are you, are you reaching like average Americans or like, let alone, you know, people who could potentially be part of a working class movement by spending all your time on Twitter? Probably not. Well, I think it's, cause it's, it's, it, I think it's worth it to, um, set two things aside. So there's, or, or kind of compartmentalize two different things. So on the, on the one hand, um, there's the question of organizing and, mm -hmm. um, how do we get more people who, uh, would be amenable to what we're talking about to, um, be organized around our projects, to be coming out to a Medicare for all canvas, um, to, you know, becoming a dues paying DSA member or something, um, or voting for the candidates that we want, um, you know, working class candidates that are putting forward mm -hmm. a, a working class political agenda. Um, there's that, how do we organize people who, you know, are not already on our side? Um, and then there's this other question of like, knowing who we're up against and mm -hmm. knowing the enemy effectively. And so, you know, we can say, I don't think that a working class person who watches Fox news, for instance, and, um, and when Fox news says, uh, you don't need Medicare for all, it's a Ponzi scheme. You're gonna, you know, it's, it's gonna ultimately hurt you and people are gonna, you know, get rich off of it or something. Um, however, they're going to spin it so that it sounds like it's, um, you know, dangerous or it's harmful to them. Um, I don't think the working class person who watches that thinks, damn, I guess I don't need healthcare. Like the response is, oh, it's not even worth trying. Like it's it's meant to to push people into resignation, not mm -hmm. to um, uh, not to like change their material interests or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, so in the same thing with like a lot of online discourse as well, that it's it's not um first like like the chart says i mean most people who are on twitter are middle class and it's a small number of middle class people who are saying all these things it's important to know what's going on there but we also have to know that that's not really what most working class people are mm -hmm. thinking about or mm -hmm. are engaged in right. they're not really interested in you know some politician is tweeting about um they're in some Twitter feud with someone and it's like, that's not why they're going to get reelected or not. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's, yeah. It's I, I mean, I think what you're saying is, is absolutely correct. Like there are two different things. One is, is this a useful tool for organizing people? I think we've sort of collectively decided no. Although Paul, you haven't weighed in yet. Uh, so, you know, I don't know, maybe- As, maybe, as the poster. Yeah, exactly. Right. As the sole yeah. poster. Um, maybe you think that Twitter is gonna save us all. Um, so there's that one issue of whether this is a good tool for organizing. I think we're saying like, not really, or like, it's not the best. Um, but then there's another question, which is, uh, should the left put resources and energy into building a kind of alternative media network? Um, we're all involved with Jacobin. We, you know, uh, do this show. Paul regularly writes for Jacobin. Kayla and I have written for Jacobin in the past. Um, I've written for other left outlets. We clearly think that there's some merit to that project, uh, which I think is a little different. Um, but, but Paul, uh, are you going to defend Twitter? I <laughs> uh, am not. Um, but <laughs> I just want to say, you know, I think I only recently came across this term of the online left. And I'm like, what? And I'm, and people are really using it as like, it's a thing, like it's a party or something. And it's just such an absurd, absurdity, you know? And obviously social media can be a tool. And it's funny talking about whether Twitter is um, good for organizing, I would say no, but a surprisingly high number of, um, you know, labor fights have involved like workers using Facebook groups. And in general, Facebook mm -hmm. is at least slightly more, um, you know, tailor to be able to do stuff like that, you know, but it's a tool, but it, like Kale said, it doesn't get at the really deeper long-term relationships you need for high stakes action. And in general, I mean, just from what I've experienced and seen in the union world, like don't ever underestimate like what literally 
going to a happy hour with coworkers, <laughs> how important, like seriously, how crucial and important that is or social events or parties are for, for organizing. Um, and I think people get this thing online where they claim these really weird political identities that are detached from reality. It's like, what does it mean to be like a third worldist tanky in the United States in 2021? It's like, <laughs> it's very detached from anything or even like a Marxist Leninist to, to like mm -hmm. claim that so tightly in 2021 in the United States. But I think it kind of gets at to like, well, if you're in a certain echo chamber online, that that might make sense. You know, it suddenly um, feels important to like use those labels or something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't understand it, but, but maybe <laughs> something about online, you know, but I do think that the alternative media institutions are important. And I think like utilizing YouTube is big. I mean, there's been a lot of people, you know, recently I can send them a YouTube clip and like get them interested, you know, and I think, I think I mentioned it on the show before, but um, I mean, Harvey K brought up a while ago in a, some YouTube thing about, you know, the need for like this new podcast left to kind of like get to the next level of making it something where more average people who are not already in the left would kind of listen to it almost like they would listen to a, a radio show or a new show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I think that is like our task and, and there's outlets like rising that have a really big viewership and you can sit down and watch that and kind of feel like you're watching MSNBC, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, so I think those are positive developments and, and that was an insult, by the way. I just meant like the, uh, <laughs> not the content of MSNBC, but you know, like the, it's very professional, well yeah, done, yeah, you know, of course. Yeah. Easy, easy to watch. And I think the, like pla giving people like, like we do, like Richard Hooker and, and union activists a platform is very important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there's also just one last thought, I guess, on this, and then I'll buzz out. Um, but uh, because there's there's two different kinds of media that the left ha does produce and needs to produce, um, and that's of course the first one is what Paul is saying that you, you know it's just media that you can just send to someone and say, hey, this is what this is where we you know I think about um, this is what I think about this given political issue and. Um, you know, I think it's an interesting perspective and you should check it out. Mm -hmm. And it's useful because of course, we're not gonna be able to have conversations with every single person about every single little political thing. And so it's good to just put everything in a video or you know, not everything, but some things in a video, make it coherent, try to help articulate, like this is how our economic and political system works. Um, get rid of all the smoke and mirrors and mm -hmm. just get to the root of like, this is actually the structure that rules a lot of our lives. Uh, and this is ultimately how we can deal with it. Um, and so again, a show like rising does, you know, when they do the radar segments, that's part of what they're doing there. And that's again, ultimately what we try to do to an extent here. But the other side of course, is also, um, you know, the, the left actually has to think through certain political topics and questions themselves. And so, yeah. um, that's a lot of what we've been doing with this Jacobin YouTube channel, um, because we have not yet reached out to the masses as effectively as, as we should be. And we will be very soon. You will see some fun stuff. You just got to go on Facebook more. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. it. The chart, the got percentage, it. the chart showed it. Yeah. No, no. YouTube is number one, Paul. We're, mm. we're, uh, we're still hitting the masses. But we just don't this. have any excuse. Okay. Yeah, no, we're, <laughs> this is, this is more of a personal failing to be honest, but, nice. um, I like those, uh, but, but again, it's those things that are trying to help clarify the world in simple and understandable terms for most people. And then those things that are trying to help the left understand what its own political um, practice and, and uh, strategy and theories are. Like mm -hmm. we, we have to get some of that stuff right because we actually do wanna change the world. So right. if our theories are all over the place and not clear and not coherent, if our strategies um, are actually not very effective, then we're committing political malpractice by mm -hmm. trying to go into the world and then actually change things when we haven't really thought things out well enough. Um, and obviously, you know, that's not, that doesn't mean we should all just be sitting at home reading books. Um, that's why we're trying to do these kind of videos so that we can actually um, kind of condense some of the arguments, the discussions so that we can spend more time actually doing the organizing work because that's, probably the place that the left uh, is the most underdeveloped right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, well said. Uh, everybody go check out Kale's article from Posting to Politics if you have not read it yet. Uh, it's in Jacobin. Um, and I think on that note, let's now bring yeah, out Leslie. This was Leopold. also, this was Jen's idea, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> it was. And make yeah, sure, Kale, Kale make sure you just... post his article too, you know. Yeah, definitely right. put that on Twitter and every other social media platform. Um, but now for a man who organizes offline. <laughs> <laughs> right, Les Leopold. Um, so Les here is the director of the Labor Institute. He's the author of several books, including Runaway Inequality, The Looting of America. And we're going to talk a lot about this as a training program he's developed. And also one of my favorite books in the world. I swear I'm not just saying that because he's here. The Man Who Hated Work and Loved Labor, The Life and Times of Tony Mazzocchi. Please go out and buy that book if you haven't. Um, and welcome, Les. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so maybe let's start with the Runaway Inequality Program. Um, can you talk a little bit about where did the idea for it come from? And how did you get unions to start running these programs and adopting it? Well, that's an interesting story. Uh, in 2015, uh, I was asked by Bob Master of the CWA, political director in New York, uh, to, to do five half day sessions on movement building. And uh, I said, oh, that sounds great. What, what do you mean by movement building? He said, I have no idea. <laughs> Oh, okay. So uh, I, ha I, I happened to be working on Runaway Inequality, uh, the book. And I said, can I use the book as uh, a template for the, for the program? And he said, sure, do whatever you want. So the, pro <coughs> excuse me, the program, uh, the half day was part of a two-day uh, training program that they do for rank and file members to teach them how to do political action organizing. So they kind of, they get two days off a month and they come in and <clears throat> and and they get to do uh, a whole bunch of things. I had them for half day, about thirty people. These were uh, very mixed group, men, women, all different shades, and uh, telephone operators, public sector workers, whole whole range of people. So we would do a chat, have them read a chapter. I we do some uh, small group discussions based on the chapter, and then we move on to another issue. And uh, at, the, at the end of the program, after five sessions, I went around the room and I said, okay, if we publish this book, how many copies uh, would you want for your local, uh, your locals? And we went around the room and when we got done, it was 3,100 copies. I went, what? In that room alone, they wanted 3,100 copies based on what they'd seen. So I was pretty stunned. Uh, and uh, the woman running it, Margarita Hernandez, terrific organizer, uh, came out of a uh, uh, working families party originally. And she starts talking to them after I'm gone. And they said, you know, we really like this program. We'd like to spread it, but we'd like to do the training. Hmm. I said, whoa, she told me about that. And the CWA has a very interesting internal structure they have these uh, interest payments on their uh, interest that they accrue on strike funds, and they use that for special projects. So they decided to invest in a very large scale runaway inequality training project. Uh, and I, 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 could, I had to pinch myself when this thing started to come together. Uh, so it, it entailed us training, uh, well, went up to about 60 workers to become trainers. And they, in turn, went out each year and ran full day workshops for a total of thousand pe a thousand people. So a thousand people got release time paid by the union to come to these workshops. And uh, they did the training in pairs. It was uh, all done through this non lecture small group methodology. And uh, they became like that cadre became a cadre. It was like they, I didn't know if this was going to work. I, I hadn't decided to spend my life doing this uh, or the rest of my life. I was just ready to move on to another book. And they said, no, no, this thing is really going. Uh, and they got incredibly committed to it. Mm -hmm. Not only did they do these classes, they started doing classes for community groups, jobs with justice, allies. Uh, 
and so on. They started running on their own time. They ran classes on Saturdays, uh, not getting paid or anything like that. They just became wildly enthusiastic about it. Uh, you know, COVID took a, a bite out of it, uh, but they, they're now doing it online two days, uh, it, it, you know, five hours each day uh, online. We, ju we just went through a train the trainer program on that. And it's been uh, flat out uh, successful. Uh, and now we're trying to move it to the Teamsters. I'll tell you more about that. <laughs> There's three problems with doing this. Uh, don't let me filibuster here, but uh, one is content. The second is access. And the third is delivery. So, you know, what's the content? Uh, wh where does that come from? Well, it, it took really about 40 years to develop it, to be sure that we knew how to have this dialogue. When I got going, I was an intern with Tony Mizaki, Oil Chemical Atomic Workers, 1974. I hate to, you know, I was, I was four years old, so <laughs> not that old. Uh, and he, I thought I was going there to work on occupational safety and health. And he said, no, 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 that's not what I want you to do. This was 1974. He says, I think the economy is in trouble. I want you to do political, radical political economy for workers. He knew about radical political economists. He was always up to date on this stuff. And he says, just don't call it radical. Find a way to do it. Find some of these economists and, and you know, just don't, don't use jargon. So that started the project. And uh, we concentrated on trying to reach people like oil, chemical, and atomic workers. You don't get much more conservative than that. And Mazaki's fear that he expressed then was if we don't do this, if we don't do uh, progressive education for these kinds of working people, they're going to go to the right. A demagogue is going to come along and mobilize them. He told us this again and again for years, saying you've got to do this. You've got to keep this education going. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, the economy didn't collapse right away. Uh, and uh, the way we survived was not by doing political economy because the demand just wasn't there. Unions were not about to pay for that. Uh, but we got involved in occupational safety and health and we, and we ended up working on the delivery system. And we, and we, and we slowly were gaining access. The delivery system uh, we picked up, uh, I, I sort of, I was, Paul, you're a teacher, is that right? Yep. Yeah. Teacher, yeah. Okay, so uh, I realized early in this process that uh, I wasn't going to be a salt. My parents were working class people. They, they slaved to get me into, you know, pay for me to go to college. I went to good schools. And I, I wasn't going to go back into a factory. Uh, I, I thought I could play a different role, kind of a translator role between the academy and, and working people. And I had a feel for how to. Uh, create very participatory things with working people because I wasn't a great student myself. So if I could understand something, I figured I could get somebody else to understand it. Uh, so, uh, but then I ran across a, a guy doing education for the Trade Union Congress in England in about 1980 at a Highlander conference on participatory education. And when I saw what he was doing, I said, whoa, that's way better than what we're doing. So I, he said, come on over. And I, I went over, uh, my now wife and I went over and uh, spent a month. They, at that point, they were doing education. Uh, every shop steward in England got a day uh, uh, once a year. Once a year went through like an eight-week course or something on occupational safety and health. It was a gigantic program. And all these people taught it. And they had learned their training method from Pablo Freire's work. And uh, uh, it was very participatory, but very structured. And uh, I went through these, just sat through these classes again and again and again. And I realized, I said, I didn't know any health and safety. And I still don't know any health and safety. But I realized the workers did. And that they, that they could become the trainers. This method, it was very uh, uh, driven by materials and problems that people solved in small groups which we now call the small group activity method. And I realized that that method, one, would work. And two, workers could become trainers. So I'm gonna tell you the whole story here. So we come back from England and we have an opportunity. Uh, two things come up. Uh, one is we, we were already doing uh, 
classes, uh, workshops with a uh, uh, UAW local in Linden, 5,000 members. Uh, there were some progressives who had captured some of the leadership offices and they liked us and they, uh, we were doing uh, some health and safety and sewers training and, and we, we would sneak political economy into uh, health and safety training and they liked it. So, uh, but the concession contract came up, I think it was GM 1983. So, uh, we worked out something with them that uh, this was, you know, the first, really the first big gigantic concession contract where workers, you know, to save GM, workers were going to give up whatever. And we designed an educational program by setting up a committee of workers and together we produced a curriculum. It was, it was a short one, three hour curriculum, and they paid for workers to uh, uh, get out of work. And half an hour early, and, and the next shift coming in, we get out of, uh, could go to work a half hour late, and we'd have a, like a three hour or two and a half hour, whatever class uh, between shifts, and uh, it was pretty good. It basically made the case that concessions were a disaster, and the kind of concessions you needed were management concessions, not uh, worker concessions. That was more or less, but it was data driven, and it was all done in small groups. And first, I did the training. Then I did the training with with a couple of uh, of the members, uh, uh, and then they did the training all by themselves. And they ran like I don't know 400 people through this. And then we produced a booklet, of a anti concession booklet based on the class, and they passed that out to 5,000 members. And so you had like 300 people on the shop floor who went through the class, and then you had the booklet. That local went against concessions by a higher percentage than any local in the whole country, like. 80% went again. So when we saw this, it was like, holy cow, what do we have here? This is amazing. None of us predicted it, it would work this way. Uh, then we got picked up by uh, the Merck pharmaceutical workers who had uh, were about to get locked out. And we did the same program again. We did the same thing in small groups, same thing with worker trainers, and we had something. Then along came these large NIHS health and safety grants, and we teamed up with the OCAW, and uh, we were able to survive. I mean, we've been going on and off unemployment during this whole period. That's just the way it worked uh, to keep the, the, our little labor institute afloat. But then we started to get some regular funding, and our deal with OCAW was, yeah, we'll do this health and safety program, but all the training has to be done by workers, all done in this non-lecture method. And they said, go ahead, try it. And it took off. It's it, it, right now. It's the, every single uh, uh, grantee in this program uses the small uses small groups, uses worker trainers. They have conferences, uh, trainers exchanges of all worker trainers coming together. Anyway, so that's how that that's how we got. So that's that that gave us our delivery system, and now we were getting some access because we had the resources to spend time also to work with CWA and other unions along the way on political economy. But the key now, the key is how do you develop the content? And that is a dialectical process of the conversations that you're having with all these workers. What's going to work and what's not? And you, you in your previous uh, section here, you were touching on the lodestone here, which is what sells is solidarity. We are so racialized in our consciousness. We see the world, we talk about white people again and again and again. And that is probably the worst thing we could possibly do. The last thing in the world we need is white essentialism, let alone black and brown essentialism. We don't need people to think that race is real. Uh, I would like to show you, if I could, uh, but, you know, watch out. I, I'll just keep going because I've got some materials here to show you what we do. But the cool thing is that this whole program now is driven by the workers themselves. Think about the kind of penetration you get with radical ideas when the workers themselves are doing it and believe in it, are pushing it. And all we're doing is fine tuning it on the outside. Les, did you want to show? Did you want to show the chart that you had sent to us earlier with the different races? <laughs> yeah. I, okay. I, I let's want to show you two kinds of charts. Okay. Let's pull uh, up that chart. Okay. 
This one is kind of cool. This is a, I think it was 1926, a Pittsburgh uh, steel related facility. And this is the height of, 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 racial, of scientific racism and uh, the new managerial uh, human relations control of the workforce. Now this is Pittsburgh, this is steel. And we gotta remember in 1919, there was a gigantic steel strike. 250,000 people went out and they lost. If this is one of the big, uh, uh, the, the union lost, the AFL lost. Uh, it was very strongly supported by AFL unions from New York, like the, uh, the needle trades, the clothing workers and so on. Uh, but management was determined never to let that kind of thing happen again. So, so on uh, the rows of this chart are a list of all the races, starting with American white, going all the way down. Somewhere in the middle is American black, by the way, just below Scandinavian, but above Dutch. And all the way in the bottom are Armenians, Mexicans, and Jews in last place. The columns are the skills that are needed in this plant. And they go from, uh, you know, doing concrete work, you know, carpentry, uh, uh, all kinds of things. And if it's a white, and, and, and they do good, fair, and poor. If you have a white box, that means you are good. Fair is the, ba is the uh, uh, gray, and black means you're bad. You're no good at, at this. Why are you no good at this? Because it's part of your race. The difference between culture and race was, did not exist. <laughs> it was the same thing. So we asked people uh, to look at this chart, find themselves, and then, and then this is all done in their small groups. And we asked them, what is race? What is it? Uh, and so they have this a very rich discussion uh, uh, based on that. Then we asked them the question is, uh, why are the Jews on the bottom? Now, we don't really know the answer, but uh, uh, you know, we, we're not 100% sure, uh, but uh, they, they get to wrestle with that a little bit. Uh, always yeah, I was gonna say, I was gonna say on that chart, like the Jews, man, at all the way at the bottom, ranked poor on everything. That's right. like, <laughs> it's a little shocking. <laughs> yeah, well, the reason, we think the reason is that it's a, it's a signal that management is saying, don't hire Jews, they're mm -hmm. bad workers, but yeah. also, if you do hire a Jew, they're likely to be a union plant, right? Because uh, both the clothing workers and right. <laughs> uh, you know uh, lady garment workers were primarily Jewish unions, and they weren't that far away, and they were putting a lot of money into organizing, uh, right. and were deeply involved in previous strikes. Anyways, mm -hmm. it's a very it's 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 a terrific discussion, and uh, uh, you the idea of race is a social construction. This is how we construct it. Uh, uh, right, is that the idea, and it also breaks down the idea that white is one thing. White is not one thing, not in these people's minds. Right, yeah, uh, I saw on the chart there was like Finnish, like uh, you said, most Armenian, of it different yeah. So called people that we're calling white now. Uh, uh, anyway, so the, to, to me, it's, it's an utter disaster when we keep trying to drill in white, mm -hmm. white, white. Let me show you another one if I could. Uh, the chart that ch the, the chart that we all know about is the disparities in wealth. So if you look at white, black, and brown, if we could bring that one up, yes, this is a killer. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the racial uh, wealth gap, and we we share this with them. Uh, it, it's enormous the amount of wealth that a white person has compared to uh, African American. You know what? Six to one, seven to one, Hispanic, and on top of it all, a uh, uh, a high school white dropout has more wealth than a, uh, an average than a high school, than a African American college graduate. I mean, is this racism or is this racism? This is like the ultimate of. And what are we doing here? We're aggregating all the white people, right? So the 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 multi billionaire is in this chart, as well as you know the poorest of poor whites. They're all white. So we have them together. So now we move on. We say, now let's break this down within each racial group. Mm -hmm. here, here is white people, <laughs> white people by decile. So the top 
10% have 74% of all white wealth. And if you look carefully, the bottom 50% basically have bupkis, nothing. All right, now let's look at what comes up next, black. Here's black. Oh, once again, the top 10% have 70% of all uh, uh, black wealth, and the bottom 50% have nothing or less than nothing. How about Hispanic? Maybe it's fair. Oh, 70%. <laughs> so what it turns out is the bottom 50% of black, white, and brown don't have anything in terms of wealth. Solidarity, that's the theme. That's our theme. How to build solidarity in an era of great divisions. How the hell do you do that? That's what we, that's the hunger that you saw in that Yale thing. People want solidarity. Mm -hmm. it's, you so talk just, white privilege to them? Oh, I got, I got to tell you one more story. <laughs> okay. This is really cool. Uh, actually, this is, uh, this actually brought tears to my eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw a, a couple of the lefty staff at CWA, you know, as they, as they were getting more comfortable with these trainers, and these trainers are salt of the earth, you know, black, white, brown, uh, men, women, and they were starting to, you know, some of the uh, uh, white trainers, white male trainers, uh, you know, from Long Island, Staten Island, uh, they were starting to talk about uh, white privilege. And I'm watching this one guy sort of go, oh, you know, you know <laughs> really good trainer too. Oh, one of the best. And I'm going, I, I, so I'm talking to these uh, lefties. I go, what are you doing? And they say, you know, uh, the usual conversation takes place. So I write something, uh, I don't know what, I can't even remember where I published it, uh, about white privilege. And basically I was making an argument that we should have, we should have an empirical uh, uh, test to see whether white privilege or the language of uh, universal human rights is the best way to organize working class people. We should just, it, it shouldn't be an ideological question without testing it, right? So I described, you know, back in the 60s, you know, the, the weather men and women were really big into white skin privilege. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew several, and, uh, you know, I, I heard it from beginning to end. It was really something, the way they were trying to destroy their own white skin privilege. It was, it was quite something. And, and, and I, I went through the, uh, uh, some of the history of the way the CIO tried to address racism in Pittsburgh again, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the 30s and 40s, desegregating, you know, uh, 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 bars and uh, restaurants and whatever. Uh, but they used this language of universal rights. So I said, you know, not a bad way to do it. And I wrote it basically for these, these folks that were the staff that were pushing this. That's, uh, that's why I wrote it. Uh, well, two things happened. One is I got thrown out of various organi organizations that were using runaway inequality. They stopped using it because they decided I was a racist. And there, so there must be some racism in runaway inequality. Although they couldn't find it, they, 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 they basically said, we can't work with you anymore because this is upsetting to our, our folks. Hmm. I said, oh, that's interesting. And CWA was a coalition partner. One of these was an anti, you know, one of these uh, anti uh, Wall Street type organizations. Uh, and CWA stuck up with me, but I said, "Look, don't, don't, don't push it. Let it go." But here's the part that that blew my mind. We we have these tune-ups every once a year, probably bring all the trainers together, uh, some hotel, some place for two days, three days, and debrief. How's it going? Introduce them to new stuff. So unbeknownst to me, I'm sitting there, and they said, "Oh, we're going to have a debate on white privilege." Uh, I said, what? Well, I'm just sitting there. And they had given everybody my article. I knew nothing about this. And they had people who thought it was a good idea to, to they had a formal debate to, to be the debaters against it. And people who thought it was, uh, uh, who, who were uncomfortable with it to debate in behalf of it. And they had this incredible debate. They didn't try to convince anybody that, to, you know, that the result was just to discuss it. And they had this incredible discussion. I mean, this one guy who was, uh, I think, from Poland, but uh, he just described how, you know, he he went he he would go with this Hispanic training trainer someplace, 
and no one would bug him and everybody would bug her about, you know, where she was from, even though he wasn't, you know, he just basically got his green card not long ago. And this woman up who was training up in Montana was getting stopped on the road. Uh, you know, she's an illegal immigrant or whatever. And, and it was such a rich, rich conversation. Nobody was trying to browbeat anybody else. They were just trying to think it through. Mm -hmm. And I literally, I, I, I had tears in my eyes. I thought, this is it. This is what political education will look like uh, if you're going to try to build a working class movement. All so, right. so that uh, that you know, as as you had mentioned, we were discussing earlier the kind of pros and cons of using like a, just a class frame as opposed to like just a race frame as opposed to a class and race frame, um, and we discussed that as it pertains to an academic study in in the beginning of the talk, as as you mentioned, um, in in your you know running all of these workshops over the years, have you found that one approach works better than the other, or like have you found that there is a certain time when a race frame is really useful? The frame that we use that works, that ties it all together, is runaway inequality. Mm -hmm. So it's neither the race nor the class frame. It's building solidarity around runaway inequality, showing how the, the here's what we found. Uh, the world comes at working class people in an incredibly fractured way. I don't think the three of us can understand how fractured it is. Uh, you know, we've been reading uh, books about macro social and economic life for years, right? So we, we think of systems and we think of ways things are held together. Most people see the world as this issue, that issue, another issue, and there's their mind naturally struggles to piece them together. That's why you see conspiracy theories come up all the mm -hmm. time or people tell, you know, uh, uh, if I could show you one more chart on the rise of, uh, uh, CEO versus worker pay. Uh, we ask people what they think it is, uh, and they have a, uh, they, they work on this in their small groups, and it's gone up, it's gone crazy since neoliberalism took place, from 45 to 1 to 800, over 800 to 1 in the last decade. And we also ask them what they think it ought to be, uh, and uh, there's some great polling that shows that even, uh, the e even strong Republicans think it should be like about 12 to one, Democrats five to one for an average of seven to one. And most of our classes now it's like 10 to 20, 30 to one, you know, things have changed a little. And it's 800 to one. And it's like absolutely outrageous. This is what we hold the class together on. We hold, why did this happen? How did this happen? How does this connect all the other issues that, that all the way from you know race to environment uh, uh, to healthcare, how does it all fit together? Uh, and and we have a, a pretty uh, solid and I think digestible way to piece it together. And, and that and and that's powerful. So that you know when you first look at this and you ask people you know what happened, they'll say, well you know it's the gold standard, or you know they're going to have some quirky little thing that they've heard somewhere place that they're trying to piece it all together with. And then we come in with something much stronger. And I'm not doing the training. You got to remember this. Workers are doing the training. They're telling me, and we're seeing it, that they're these about two hours in, three hours in, there's this aha moment when people are going, holy cow. Oh, my God. Oh. I get it. I get it. They, and and there are enormous sections on race in this curriculum. You can it's there for free at runawayinequality.org. Uh, all one word. Anybody can take it. Use it. We have it in Spanish and English. Uh, 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 but but it, it's it's remarkable to see what happens. And the racial stuff is all about the visions. We go all the way back to you know from the Chinese rail workers to you know the indentured servants back uh, you know in the 1600s. Example after example of how uh, corp, you know, the bosses have used race to divide us again and again and again. Uh, to my, frankly, for my taste, it's almost too much. Uh, really, it's just like it's like overwhelming. There's one activity that they do that I thought was going to be so hokey. Uh, thank God, Chris Rabb, who comes out of CWA, works for us, is a, a talent. I mean, she loves doing train the trainers, and and she loves working on the curriculum. And she's got, and she's tough. So she says, I don't care what you think, we're gonna do this. 
And what they got people to do in their groups is draw, this is like near the end, draw a world without runaway inequality. Either the community, the country, whatever. And they draw these pictures. And they're beautiful. It works. I thought, oh, this is going to be, you know, the guys are going to just sit there and roll their eyes. No, they get into it. And it has, you know, uh, uh, you know, free higher education, universal health care, you know, the commons is protected. It's, it's just great stuff. It's like, it's really what you're talking about when you talk about socialism. And they're not, you don't have to use the word, you know, again, the point is solidarity, not division. We're not trying to create distinctions. We're trying to show co the common human condition in a world that's being destroyed by neoliberalism, although we don't use that word. We use runaway inequality instead. Okay, now I'm going to give you a problem. We're trying to sell this program right now to the Teamsters. We already have one program going in the Teamsters, which is a combination with a Brotherhood of Maintenance Away which right. is a combination of runaway inequality and uh, Medicare for all. And we've got that going with some other unions with uh, through the single pay, labor for single payer uh, organization. So we're helping them uh, and that's going really well. So now the public sector division of the Teamsters, that's 200,000 members, uh, are interested. They went, they sat through the, some of the train the trainer and they've asked us for a proposal uh, uh, for the whole nine yards. Okay. They have police and correctional. How do, you, how do you run a political economy course for them? Think about that. What are you going to do? Right? Now, especially now. Right? They're, what are you going to do? Prison population has grown lockstep with runaway inequality. That's where we yep. put our surplus population. That's what the prison guards do. Take care of our certain population. So uh, we're going to the Correctional Facilities Conference in a couple of weeks, virtually. We're gonna sit there for two days and we're gonna hope we can find some people we can talk to, uh, create a little curriculum team saying, you know, run them through runaway inequality uh, in general and say, okay, tell me what we need to do to uh, tailor this. I'll give you one more a clue to how, to do, how we're gonna do this. We already do the following. Uh, we talk about Michael Brown, Ferguson. He said, we don't really know. There were no body cams, right? We don't know how he got killed. He got killed. And then we look at, uh, there was an incredible Justice Department report that looked at what was going on in the 21 communities around St. Louis at the time. And what was going on is they, uh, because of the financial crisis, because of runaway inequality uh, and, and its impact on uh, resources, they told the police to virtually double the number of people that they were going to arrest uh, on and bring them into the uh, criminal justice system, uh, so they would pay more fines and forfeitures. They doubled their budgets were about seven, eight percent came from fines and forfeitures. You know the points on your tickets, and you know they get you in for court fees, and they, your light, you know your car lights on, but then there are other things you have. They get you for later on, and so on. Uh, or you haven't paid you know, child support, they get you to bring you in for that. So they doubled it to 13% in Ferguson and every place else. So the cops literally were tax collectors. So they were going around looking for people, you know, a kid jaywalking, right? That, that might have been his crime. Uh, so you're turning the cops into tax collectors. Here's another one for you. All the stuff that's going on with, with the killings now. Uh, uh, George Floyd. I mean, horrendous, right? Absolutely horrendous. What are the cops doing? What we're not talking about is what is their role in a low income community? Oh, why is there a low income community? Why do we still have poverty 50 years after we realized it was a structural problem in the 1960s? Right? That it wasn't the problem of people picking themselves up by their bootstraps. It was the problem of there weren't enough jobs around and they weren't paying enough. That's what the freedom budget was about in the 1960s. Uh, it was equivalent to $15 an hour now. And poverty. That's what King was starting to, to work so hard on. Where's that discussion now in terms of this, the police brutality? We've, it, we're asking them to police poverty. That's our poverty program. Put them in jail and 
go in there and you know lock down the crime. And let's not pretend there's not dangerous crime in those neighborhoods. I don't know about any particular one, but you know there's that's the the entrepreneurial spirit is in uh, illegal what we've made illegal the drug the, you know the drug community and so on. So I think there's something there, but you know we could get blown out of the water. This is iterative. This is not something you can figure out theoretically. This is like you got to go and try it, talk to people. If it works, you know it'll be a miracle. Have me on again because I, you know, I can walk on water. I was say, can we like film those sessions and just? We'll yeah, just we need to know what happens. Yeah, you know, well, you know, I think at some point I could get you into the CWA classes if you want to. I'm going to make one more observation. Uh, you guys are really talented. I mean, really talented. And I think the idea of developing publications for working people that you could do it. I, I, you know, your, your, your data that you got from, uh, from the, uh, social media, those are the people, 80% of the people on social media, mm -hmm. not 80% of all Americans. Oh yeah, well, of course. Yeah. 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 So, right. I, you know, I have a feeling the old fashioned booklets and newsletters, uh, might actually still work. Stick and to analog. Gonna, that's your recommendation. <laughs> well, I don't know. You can do all of it. Right. But you're going to have us back selling for working class audiences all, of all shades and colors. Yeah. Uh, learning, how, learning how to do that, and then pulling it. I, I, I can't. I think you guys have all the talent in the world to do it. So that's the third. You know, you had three elements before that Kale was talking about. Yeah, two elements, right? Right. Uh, you know, dialogue to sort of get our head straight, learn more, which is critical. Dialogue to kind of reach out through social media. But I'd say direct dialogue with working class people uh, would be an incredible education for the left. But my biggest fear is we've become uh, spatially uh, disjointed now. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we live in our, we talk to the same, we talk to people who kind of agree, agree with us. We're in the same, we live in the same areas. We live in progressive areas. Uh, and we're out of touch, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, and it's hard to get in touch. It's hard, but I think, I think you guys could do it. Uh, and, and, uh, I think, I think you intuitively and theoretically grasp the need for solidarity. Uh, and you can experiment with frames. You can, exp you can do whatever you want, but you'll find out, you know, people right. start ripping the thing up and throwing it away. Mm -hmm. But if people start wanting to come to the forums, you would hold afterwards. Uh, so what you're saying working. is, <laughs> I should sell my leftist newspaper in front of workplaces. That's what you're saying. Well, kind of. I don't know about selling it, but uh, yeah, yeah, I'm kidding. Finding people, you know, back to the T U U L from uh, the yeah. 20s, uh, uh, and, and this goes all the way back to Mizaki, which is he wanted that dialogue. He wanted the dialogue between progressives and working class people because that's how he built his local from the inside out. And, and that, that's actually a great segue because I was going to ask you to talk because in your book about Mizaki, there's some really, really great, inspiring examples of the political education he did in his local and, you know, with workers that today liberals would write off as hopelessly, you know, Long Island sub, uh, suburban racist. Um, so can you kind of talk about like how did he do that in his local I know you could probably talk like two hours no, about no, no, it. No, but, no. Uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm smiling because I Bobby Junta, who was one of the people in that in that group, still calls me. He's 91 really? years old. He, he's the one that sort of gave me a tour of the factory in Long Island, where it was, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it, this guy, I, I want to talk about Bobby because he, he's he's really something. So he was a, a high school, another high school. Uh, I don't know if he was dropout or not, but anyway, uh, he always liked to read books, but he read uh, you know mysteries or whatever. Uh, and he had a job. He, he got this, uh, you know, got the job in this plant. He, he means uh, he was very ca a very uh, devout Catholic. Meets Mizaki, and uh, Mizaki's assault. He's trying to, you know, build a, uh, uh, take this local away from it, this anti commie guy. Uh, uh, and uh, slowly but surely, but he he starts to build up a book club with. Uh, it, it, the plant was kind of it, it was it was interesting there was a male female divide uh, uh there were there was like 80 percent women maybe 20 percent men but the men had the time to be in the book club the women went home and had to 
do the rest of the family life. But they, uh, by the way, this local, uh, the, the militancy and solidarity was so great in this local. This local went out and picketed on other people's strikes again and again and again uh, uh, to the point, and, and they got wage increases that they were getting paid. This was Helena Rubenstein uh, cosmetic workers on an assembly line were getting paid more than the aircraft workers on Long Island at Grumman and had better benefits. Uh, that, that's how, how, how strong they were. But anyway, they, he had him read these books and this guy, Junta said, he ruined me. I, I mean, I couldn't, he goes, I couldn't friggin' sleep for six months because I realized I was an atheist. And he, he kept giving him these books, uh, 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 you know, sort of labor's untold story and, you know, one after the other, the other. And this cadre formed and, uh, that, you know, they, they were socialists. Mazaki convinced them that, that and, and they believed that they could pull it off, you know, uh, a transformation of socialism in a reasonably short period of time. And, you know, like universal health care, all this kind of stuff. Matter of fact, one of them, uh, and, and what Mazaki would do is he would send them to all these conferences and, to, and, to, and what he would do, instead of sending one person, he would send four and make them all sleep in the same room. Uh, so, you know, he, he would just spread the money around uh, to bring more and more people to conferences. It, by 1968, this, this is a riot. By 1968, when Columbia took place, uh, I'm going to jump out of sequence here a couple of times. Uh, one of the guys actually went to the campus and tried to help them understand which things they should take over, like get the mimeograph machine. Get, go, you know, he, he literally were coaching them on how to take over you know, the campus. I mean, they consider themselves absolute militants. In 55, in 1950, by 1955, the takeover by Mizaki sort of happened you know, from 48 to 52, three. By 55, he's, he's running the local and, and it's growing. You're organizing shops all over the place. But uh, they start going out into the community and raise money for to buy a car to send to Birmingham to help with the boycott. So civil rights, they, they were marching in all white communities to demand segregation. And this was done through political education. Mazaki was leading the education, but he turned them on to all kinds of things. He had them read all kinds of stuff. Had like a, 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 a series of books that turned him on that he got to turn them on. And so, so he he was the biggest believer of education I have ever ever met. He built the occupational safety and health movement when he got to be a higher official at the OCAW. He built it around education. Uh, it was funny. He was supposed to be the lobbyist for the oil chemical and atomic workers. This is in uh, the late sixties, uh, and he's getting. Uh, uh, but he hates lobbying, and he's getting these calls from rank and file workers saying. There's all this crap in my plant. There's, you know, uh, everybody's coughing, and this, you know, the Cayuga River caught fire, and the, or, uh, the chemical and oil industry is booming during you know, the height of the Vietnam War. Uh, started, he was, by the way, built a labor uh, phalanx against that as well, and that was really tough. Again, based on education, but he starts. He realizes nobody knows anything about what these these fumes are. No, really, nobody knows anything. And he organizes a series of workshops. This is to help get OSHA passed. He made a deal with the other union lobbyists. They say, he said, you do the stuff inside Washington. I'm going to take this on the road across the country. And he went district to district and he brought in a couple of docs uh, and he had all these workers come in to talk about their problems. And they started to you know, basically do minimum amount of education because the docs didn't know anything either. I have the transcripts of all these things. And it's right today, an average steel worker or former OCAW worker knows more occupational uh, medicine than the doctors knew at that time. Uh, it was, it, that's how much things have changed or how bad it was then. Anyway, by the time he got to the last one in Atlanta, he's on, the whole thing is on the Today Show. He turned it into kind of this national phenomenon, and it, it, I think made a big difference in passing OSHA. But he believed in education. He then he worked with Eula Bingham, who was the head of OSHA uh, under uh, Carter, uh, and 
got the New Directions educational program going on occupational safety and health. He just believed in education. But the, the piece, though, that had to be there was the political economy because he knew the, the uh, health and safety. He, he had thought that health and safety was going to uncover a contradiction that capitalism could not resolve. In other words, you couldn't have safe production under capitalism. You'd have to kill people. Uh, and what he didn't realize was they were going to they were going to kill other people. They were just going to offshore the whole industry, uh, uh, and you know, and 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 reduce the workforce to such an extent, and make sure that the a cancer registry would never be put together, so people in the communities around these facilities would never know how much cancer they got from the facility, and so on. Uh, but he wanted the political economy to be the central feature of everything, uh, and. Uh, uh, it had, it, needless to say, he set me off in that direction, and I, I'm incapable of doing anything else. You know, if I end up talking to just the left, you know, I do a terrible job. <laughs> so, only have one skill, one trick pony. Um, and what about? So it seems like everyone's talking about cancel culture these days, and I hate to beat the dead horse, but I think this is really deeply connected to, you know, political education among working people. So. I mean, what effects, whether you want to call it cancel culture in the Occupy days, we called it call out culture. It, it was a thing then. I'm um, sure it was a thing in the 60s as well. What effect do you, do you think this is having on the left's ability to appeal to a broader base to connect? Well, you guys were talking about this before, and I just reinforce it. I mean, if you want to reinforce the frame of the right wing and alienate yourself from working people, not just, by the way, not just white working people. You, uh, uh, you just keep, you know, just if the left keeps doing what it's going to play with the cancer culture, play with, you know, basically racial essentialism, even basically keep talking about race and class, but really don't talk ever talk about class. It's always about race first and keep drilling in those, you know, they're just not, you have no, you have, you're, you're delivering working people of all shades uh, to, uh, to the right. It, you know, it's, it's, it's ironic, you know, the New York Times now uh, writes a piece about, you know, geez, you know, it's, it's kind of funny that Hispanics down, you know, Texas and Florida, you know, they're just not like the Hispanics in, you know, New York in terms of their vote for the Democratic Party. It's like, duh, whoever thought Hispanic was a one size fit all category. What about the class divisions? What, you yeah. know. No, that's that's it. class divisions are, are are taboo, and 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 what we keep doing is we're trying to conflate uh, race with poverty, mm -hmm. right? That, that's what the right's been doing for years, right? Uh, welfare all of a sudden got bad when more black people were getting welfare as opposed to right. white people. Nobody mm -hmm. ever talked about it before. Then all of a sudden, you know, if you can racialize poverty. You know, you can split uh, black and white people together forever. Why are we doing that? I just, you know, it's almost like there's some, uh, and I, you know, I, I'm not entirely familiar with the ins and outs of the cancel cancer culture, but I've been canceled out a couple of times myself. I think. Uh, I was going to say you after the show, you're you're done. I'm sorry, but uh, it's over. <laughs> by, the, by the way, I, I uh, my wife, by the way, who teaches at. Uh, Empire State, uh, Harry Van Arsdale Labor uh, Center, which is, it's all, I, I will to tell you this one story because it's very important. Uh, it's it, it's uh, apprentices, electrical apprentices, and now there's women, and it's very interracial, uh, and they have to get a two-year associate's degree to become a journeyman. So they work all day, they then come to electrical theory classes, and then they come to a liberal arts labor studies program. My yeah. wife said, teaches uh, the, labor, the political economy. And uh, her class, she does uh, women in the trades class. She just uh, was telling me about a cl class last night. They were talking about the cancer, uh, cancel culture and they're talking about uh, 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 you know, whether it should be called the International Brotherhood of uh, Electrical Workers or that name she changes the women, you know, the tw 20 women in the class, maybe three guys or whatever, four guys. And it was interesting. It was the black women leading the charge for solidarity. They weren't interested in any of these cultural issues. Zero, none of them. 
They said, oh, yeah, it'd be nice. Okay, they want to change the name. Great, but we really don't care. We want solidarity. It was, and this, this came, and she was pushing on the various, you know, cultural issues. So I, I, I think I think we should maybe start listening to working people a little more. And the danger is we're not in contact with them. Mm -hmm. And yes, sell 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 the pamphlet outside the factory. I, you know, <laughs> at least at least you heard it here first, folks. Talk to you. Right. Uh, yeah. So I, I so I, I, I have I, colleagues working on uh, who are really offend. I, uh, uh, one Hispanic guy on our our staff really hates the cancer culture. He's a poet. Mm -hmm. uh, one last story. So. Uh, He's written a bunch of poetry books. His name is uh, Rodrigo Tos Toscano. He's very talented. And he was doing a poetry reading at, at a college. He gets invited all over the place. And uh, uh, he's one of the characters in his poem. One of the voices is this Hispanic uh, elderly woman. And afterwards, the uh, students are critiquing him. How dare he appropriate this you know, Hispanic woman's voice? How dare he do that? And he tells them, he goes, it's my mother. <laughs> I mean, who, who among us has not imitated their mother's voice <laughs> at one it, point? It, 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 it's just sad. Yeah. It's like suicidal. It's left. Yeah. It's like suicidal. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, they're, uh, and there's look, so many. Come it's like all they want. But uh, if you want to reach uh, working people, you got to talk to them. You got to mm -hmm. listen to them. You got to mm -hmm. try out your frameworks mm -hmm. and you'll find out what works. I'm not saying ours is the best. I'm just saying it's the best I've come up with. Right. But if there were 50 other projects like this going across the country, mm -hmm. I think we'd be making, we, we could make some real progress because we'd be sharing information. We'd be coming together and say, hey, you know what? We spun it this way and mm -hmm. these worker trainers are going wild with it. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the delivery system, you know, right. uh, so, so I want to I want to follow up on that by just asking kind of one final question for you, which is a little bit more broad. Um, but since you're talking about you know sort of going outside the left and um, talking to working class people who are not necessarily already plugged into you know a movement or movement building, um, I you know everything that you've said so far, I think you know is is really interesting, and obviously I like am totally agree. Like the methods that you're speaking of sound great. Um, but you, you mostly give these talks or, you know, th these trainings happen within unions. And the sad reality is that most people in the U.S. right now are not in a union. Uh, union density is lower than it ever has been. So we need to fix that. Obviously, I think we would all agree. Where do you see the most opportunity uh, to rebuild the labor movement? Well, that's a very, very good question. A very, very difficult one. Uh, yeah. One of our most important projects that we have is with immigrant worker centers. Uh, Endelon and uh, Make the Road New York are our partners in occupational safety and health training. And also, uh, they've gotten a strong dose of runaway inequality along the way. And uh, we have meetings uh, twice a month uh, to, uh, we have a collaborative to talk about building this health and safety program. There's 50 plus uh, Endelon uh, worker centers across the country and uh, Make the Roads got one of the biggest ones and there's I think total what 250, 300 worker centers they are proto-unions and one of the things we're trying to do uh, one of the I think one of the uh, most fortuitous things that's happened is the steel workers have embraced the worker centers as partners in this occupational safety and health program uh, there's the integration is not as uh, strong as I want it, but in certain places of the country, uh, in California, the oil workers and the uh, washeros and the, uh, who've been unionized uh, into the steel workers are, you know, go to the same conferences, same meetings, you know, same uh, union, they're part of the same uh, drive. The same thing back in, in, in New Jersey. Uh, so uh, the worker sectors come out and support, you know, union strikes and uh, the, the unions embrace the, the worker centers and help helping them. So I, I think there's a lot of promise there if we don't, uh, if, 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 if we keep bringing them together in common areas and also common educational programs. The fortunate thing is health and safety is a very good bridge. And uh, uh, in, over the last year, it also allowed us uh, you know, to raise a lot of money for immigrant worker centers in 
especially in New York, New Jersey, where they're getting just decimated by uh, uh, COVID. Uh, oh, that's another piece I wrote, which was a COVID, un COVID racing class. That's another one that caused me trouble. But, uh, <laughs> I did a statistical analysis of New York and found out that the, uh, uh, the race was not the number one determinant income was about whether you could, uh, uh, whether you got COVID or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but duh, right? I, I, mean, I just want to say, I really like that article for anybody oh. who's watching that's in the American prospect. No, thank you. Check it out. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, uh, I don't have the magic bullet for right. uh, resurrecting the labor movement, but I, uh, I, I think some of what we see with runaway inequality training inside unions is hopeful because they're taking it outside to community groups that are all non-labor. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the trainers uh, who happens to be a staff guy out of uh, Detroit on his own has run 10 workshops on Saturdays uh, for community organizations. So I think the, you know, if, if, if unions become, uh, well, if they become known as fighters for justice and fight, fighters for working people, that's certainly going to help. But you're going to need changes in the law. I mean, let's face it, you're going to, maybe the Biden administration, uh, you know, somehow or another, the Democrats don't lose the House in, in two years. If this, uh, you know, these gigantic, it's funny, uh, the first thing I said when Biden came in, the first thing I said, they have got to show that they're helping working people across the country. They've got to show that. And looks like they, they were, you know, they, they didn't even call me back and thank me for telling me. <laughs> so rude. Now, I don't have they the knew answer. you were canceled, so, look, so they, yeah, didn't, they didn't want to be associated with it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, I don't think you should underestimate, or that we should underestimate. Uh, uh, yeah, unionization is low, but it's a lot of people, mm -hmm. and they're yeah. organized. Mm -hmm. uh, organizational structures are incredible. I mean, right. And this I is something to figure out. The CWA uh, has been committed to, to education for the entire time uh, that I've known them. As a matter of fact, I got pulled in by Morty Barr, the late Morty Barr was president of CWA in the 80s. And he's gone to one of my classes that I was doing at Empire State. I was in that doing, he was trying to get his, his, his BA. And he is an, an assistant, Jan Pierce came. You know, all dressed up in their suits and after a nice dinner and uh, they would come in they were like the real pork choppers and uh, he got his job by basically raiding a commie union uh and the cwa grew up as an anti-communist union and he bought the he bought the act and we went in and helped them they they adopted the small group activity method they adopt. They they went nuts over education over the last forty years. Not all, not driven uh, uh, even close to entirely by me. They had their own internal people that really got into it. You know, Larry Cohen came out of that. Uh, you know, from our revolution and so on. But they they became a fighting force uh, because they really believed in education. So I think you, I think you know if, if a few more unions uh, became, I mean, they, they could pilot something if they really educated their members, uh, introduced them to broader political economy themes, help them have a framework that links this fractured world in their heads. That's the aha moment when it starts clicking together. I think I think it could make an important contribution. You know, is it going to solve it all? I doubt it. Am I going to live to see it? I kind of doubt that too. But uh, I, I think it, it, it took, look, go back in time. How long did it take before the CIO, CIO emerged out of the wreckage of World War I. That was like 15 years, right? And a Great Depression, right? The, 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 the organizing was dead after uh, the steelworker strike uh, collapsed and the red baiting you know, was horrendous. But somehow uh, the political education continued and then emerged. Now, obviously it was the CP then that, that did it, but I don't think you need a CP to do it now. There's, uh, you guys can do it. Shifting the work on to us. Wow. Hey, you're younger. You're supposed to have more energy than me. I think <laughs> you're younger. I, I'm assuming you're younger. I dye my hair. That's what. I do. <laughs> right, right. But look, you, I, I just want to say it again. You, you guys are incredibly talented. You're really good writers. You know, you're. I, I see the way you do these shows. You know, you're, you're very professional. Uh, and I, I. 
you know, if if you don't do it, maybe you can find some other people who do it. But I think connecting, starting to figure out how to have dialogue with working people will so enrich them and what you're doing. It would just be, a, right. a, a, and I think that's what has to happen. If it takes 15 years, it takes 15 years. But I, I think that's what has to happen. And I think there could be, I think Mizaki was right. Either we build it or the right's going to build it. Right. Yeah, for sure. It's going to be us or Marco Rubio. Um, <laughs> right. Well, yeah, uh, take your pick. <laughs> well, no, Holly. Right. Well, right. Uh, uh, watch out for the hillbilly elegy guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. There, there, there are many of them. Oh, my God. Tucker. They're all, of what, there's just, you know, there's a ton of them. Mm -hmm. and, and they think, they think they've got the white working class, right? Mm -hmm. They think they th they they think they've got them. We got to prove them wrong. All right. All right. Well, well thank you very much, Les. Uh, it was okay. Good. Great having you on. Uh, definitely a lot here to think about. Um, everybody who's watching, uh, if you want to stand outside a workplace with some pamphlets, you have Les Leopold's blessing. <laughs> but go or to runawayinequality.org because there's a lot of good material yeah. there runawayinequality.org. And uh, you can actually sign up. We'll never, ever ask you for money. Uh, but we'll keep you keep you in the loop. And read that Mizaki book. I'm telling everyone, read that Thank book. You. Thank you so much for your kind words on that. It's a, It was a labor of love, I'll tell you. <laughs> All right. Thanks so All much, right. Les. Thank you, Les. Thank you. See ya. And uh, I think that was an important point he made about just how many union members there still are. You know, mm -hmm. I think the number is around 12, 14 million. And, you know- It's a lot of people. <laughs> right, and, and it's something I know Adolph Reed says this a lot. You know, people say, well, labor movement's weak, it's in decline, and it's like, okay, well, as opposed to what? You know, I mean, where <laughs> else are there 12 million working people in, even if it's a weak union in some mm -hmm. kind of organization, you know, some kind of structure. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, it, it is important to remember. We shouldn't sugarcoat obviously how weak uh, unions are right now, but right. you know, it, it's a, it's still a huge base to yeah, work from out there. 12 million is nothing to sneeze at for sure. Right, yeah. Um, on that note, I think it's labor. the perfect time for labor, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Um, just for everybody who's now tuning in or who hasn't caught this segment before, uh, Paul is our resident labor expert. So every time that he's on, he answers a new batch of questions pertaining to labor organizing, labor history, and labor movement. If you have a question for Paul, um, feel free to drop that in the chat or in the comments, and he will try to answer the next time he's on. So what do we have for today? So we have a question about, um, basically I think general strikes um, do you see the capacity for a nationwide strike or is that light years of intensive organizing away? Is it a potentially useful strategy? And so I think this question gets at the general strike and I'm glad we have a chance to talk about this. And I feel like ever since Occupy, it seems like at least every few months, the left is calling for a general strike that never happens. And so first, what is a general strike? So a general strike is basically if all workers in a certain location, whether it's a city a state or maybe even a whole country go on strike. And you could say it's the ultimate labor action, the ultimate expression of class unity and militancy short of a revolution. And you can define it in different ways. Maybe not every worker in a city goes on strike, but every unionized worker does. I think that would still count. So we've never had in this country a nationwide uh, general strike. We've had general strikes in certain cities. Um, in 1919, there was the Seattle general strike where actual Soviets style things were set up. In 1934, there were three general strikes in Minneapolis, San Francisco, and Toledo. And um, many historians believe these strikes are what really forced the hand of FDR to sign the National Labor Relations Act that gave workers the right to organize unions. Um, right after World War II, there was a strike wave that featured a few more general strikes in cities. Um, and in Europe, during like the debt crisis of the 2010s, some countries like Greece had over 15 general strikes in response to austerity imposed by the European Central Bank. And often, but not always, general strikes are political in nature. Like what's been happening happening in Myanmar, where the general strike is for an authoritarian, authoritarian regime to step down. And it seems like forever ago, but I think there was some interesting potential during the government shutdown under Trump uh, when Sarah Nelson raised the idea of a general strike to end it. And it ended up ending well before that. I think there are actually a relatively small amount of airline workers that took action and the um, 
the the shutdown ended after that. And I think it was interesting to ponder the possibility if Trump refused to step down after losing the election, if there could have been some kind of general strike. But the, you know, I think for me, the main problem is general strikes cannot be willed into existence by a left that is disconnected from the labor movement. Um, and often general strikes have happened in very exceptional situations or when the labor movement is coming from a position of strength. And they're, they aren't really something I think that you can methodically plan for and work up towards. Like this year, we're going to organize this many workers and then work up to a general strike. They, they often just don't work out that way. And, you know, the last time um, Jane McAlee was on the show, she raised kind of an interesting idea about instead of thinking about general strikes, she su suggested we think about, um, you know, a strike across a specific sector or company within a specific region. So, for example, um, you know, nurses across the hospital chain in a state or a region going on strike. And that is still incredibly ambitious, but I think it's more achievable and in a period of decline and retreat like we are now. And um, and whether you are trying for that kind of strike or a general strike, it, it still can't happen without the left being involved in the labor movement. And most of the time, the calls for general strikes are happening on Twitter. Something happens and someone will tweet out, why isn't there a general strike happening? And that's just not how it works. And so, you know, don't get me wrong. I would absolutely love to wake up tomorrow and be proven wrong and for a general strike to happen. And, you know, a lot of spontaneous, unpredictable things have happened and can still happen. And I think, you know, in, in certain cities, in certain areas right now, I think quietly behind the scenes, you have some savvy leftists that are becoming more embedded in the institutional labor movement, um, becoming in positions of power in like central labor councils. So maybe there is a city out there where um, those same people could move towards a general strike if there was a certain flare up um, around a certain issue. So I don't want to be a complete naysayer about it, but I think the left needs to get out of this habit of calling for a general strike as a reflex to, to everything that happens. They just don't work that way. And I think we're in a period now of rebuilding the labor movement, rebuilding existing unions, helping them win strong contracts and beating back concessions. And I think it makes more sense to focus there instead of a general strike. Um, so those are my thoughts on, on that issue. Um, I don't know, Jen, what do you think? Yeah, I uh, totally agree. I mean, you know, going back to what you said just at the beginning of of this segment, how you know the labor the uh, the labor movement, or I'm sorry, uh, union members are still 12 million strong. Any call for any kind of uh, mass strike, I just think has to start with the labor movement. Uh, and you know, with the exception of the Sarah Nelson example that you mentioned, like the vast majority of calls for a general strike over, you know, since the Occupy days, as you said, to now have been made by commentators or, you know, left wing activists. And I don't doubt the good intentions. I mean, we all know how powerful strikes are. We all know that strikes are the most powerful tool that workers hold. And, you know, that is obviously not to be discounted. Um, but that said, like, I don't think that a literature professor at Bard calling for a general strike on Twitter, which is like definitely a thing that happened like in the early days of the Trump administration. Like I'm not making this up as like yeah. a hyperbolic example like that. Like that just to me, to me, again, the intentions might be good, but at its very worst, it kind of reeks of this um it kind of it kind of has this feeling of like wake up sheeple, right? Like, right. hey, did yeah. you all hear about us? Did you all hear what strikes can do? Like, we should all do this. And again, I, I just want to reiterate, like, I don't think that the intentions are necessarily bad, um, but I think that you can't, as you say, just will something into being because you had a good idea or like think that it might work and without putting in the you know years, if not decades, of organizing work that it takes to make something like this happen. Um, like you said, right. I mean, a, a spontaneous eruption could happen. I'm not like willing it out. Yeah. And like, <laughs> if nobody goes to work tomorrow, like I won't either, but. <laughs> right, yeah. And I think it's an interesting question because I think some people will hear that and be like, well, what if we plan for it? And, mm. and general strikes are also, I think, interesting because often they don't happen that way either. It's True. not, yeah. you know, whereas I could maybe see a scenario of like, well, I don't know, a nurses union making a, three to five year plan of like organizing a certain chain and mm -hmm. often unions do plan that far ahead of their serious that I can see happening. But general strikes, I think are, are kind of this weird beast, unless you're at a plate, I think unless you're at a, a position where 
some of these unions in, in different places, like I mentioned, in Europe and other countries that have this very strong labor tradition where that's just been part of what they do. Mm-hmm. I think that's a different situation. Um, and again, like when there was austerity in Europe, many countries, I mean, they had something like 15 general strikes. A lot of times, a lot of times there were one day or two day strikes. You know, I think that's different. That's kind of built into the culture. And just sadly, yeah. we're just like nowhere near, near there yet. Right. You know? So, so what you're saying is if we can do one, <laughs> then we're right. setting ourselves up for maybe in the future, doing them more and more. But I do think if we stood in front of um, workplaces with less, our little newsletters. Yeah. Right. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, since you bring that up, like, I think one reason why, you know, as you say, every couple of months, like <laughs> the left is calling for a general strike uh, again, you know, a, it is kind of this recognition of the power of strikes and B, people really want to do something, you know, and it's hard to be right. like, well, just like continue organizing and like, I don't know, like talk to people in your workplace or whatever. Um, but like, right. I think it's important to remember like that's something too, you know, like go like, you know, s- see if you can get involved in a runaway inequality workshop in your workplace or something. Um, right. It's not as grandiose as a general strike, uh, but I feel like in many ways, it's just as, if not more important. I mean, right. you know, doing the small steps and and kind of building up to something bigger. Right. Yeah. And one other thing I'll say, I mean, what was kind of interesting to me thinking about the elect presidential election. Um, and again, I think it was kind of interesting pondering whether if Trump really did some crazy shit, how labor would respond. And this is what is kind of interesting about Sarah Nelson, who does have credibility in labor movement. She she came up through the ranks and, you know, uh, kind of just putting these ideas out there. And I, I always thought about with the election, you know, it would be something where labor might be willing to take that risk because it was for something very, I think, within the balance, meaning like protect, you know, protecting the Democrats uh, getting elected as they should have for a Democratic election. Um, so I don't know. It was just interesting to think about. Again, yeah. obviously it didn't happen, but um yeah, I just don't think it's very productive to keep just like calling for it or wondering when it will happen. You know, I just don't think it's going to happen that way. Have you ever participated in a call? Or I mean, like people, like as you're saying, you know, people call for general strikes all the time. Have you ever taken the day off? I know I definitely have. <laughs> like in the early Occupy days, like that, like May 1st, 2011 or whatever. Right. Damn, that's like 10 years ago <laughs> at this point. Um but yeah, when, you know, people were calling for a general strike, I definitely like called in sick that day. Oh, really? you know? I yeah. didn't. I have been part of a sick out. And okay, that's another yeah. thing. I mean, again, I, yeah, there's like yeah. so many other things that are below a general strike that are mm-hmm. hard enough to do, you know? Right. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's why sometimes I don't understand why we're always going for. From like zero to a like hundred. My first day in the NBA, I'm not going to try to break the world <laughs> record. Like I'm right. just not. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, All right. Well, on that note, I think we should wrap things up. Uh, But again, everybody, thank you for watching. It was great having Les Leopold on. Um, His book, again, is Runaway Inequality. And you can go to runawayinequality.org to learn more about the types of political education trainings that he conducts with both unions and community groups. Um, And yeah, thanks so much for watching. Uh, Please hit like and subscribe and we will see you next week. Good night, everyone.